Yeah, I just sort of. <laughs> Good afternoon. We're here to debate two things that are both pretty valuable to most of us, I think, privacy and security. So I'm going to start by asking for a show of hands. How many of you will be willing to give up your privacy for security? Raise your hands if so. Can we have the house lights up so I can actually see you all? OK. No. Tough audience. Yeah, I don't, they, they seem to they, they, they want to live on the edge, I think. OK. All right, well, we'll see if we can change your minds. I'm Rob Peguerero. I write about a variety of tech policy issues, including both privacy and security. And I'll, I'll start by telling a little story about how complicated this can get. A few years ago, I was getting off the plane at Dulles Airport in DC. I'm at the Global Entry Kiosk, which is this biometric identification system that lets you get through customs in 10 minutes. But you have to tell a lot of information about yourself, digitize your fingerprints. I look over, I thought, isn't that the chief technologist for the American Civil Liberties Union? It was. So these things are complicated. So let's get to it. To my left is Terrell McSweeney with the Federal Trade Commission. Tell the audience about yourself, please. I'm sorry? Uh, Am I ready? Yes. Well, introduce yourself. Then. Oh, I'm introducing myself. Uh, well, I'm Terrell McSweeney. I'm a commissioner at the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. In spite of our name, we have nothing to do with trade policy in the U.S. We are a data protection and consumer protection and antitrust agency. And I'm here speaking uh, my own views, not the official views of the FTC. To my right, you, you got stuck arguing against privacy. You lost a bet, right? Yeah, privacy. Who needs privacy? Well, I've worked my whole life working in cybersecurity. I help people and organizations lock down their secrets. And uh, because the guys at the Web Summit really hate me, I'm standing up here to propose the rather less popular idea that you should be willing to give up at least some, if not all, of your privacy to enhance everybody's greater collective security. All right. Who wants to go first? Each of you has five minutes allotted to make the case for your position. I, I nominate Dermot. I think he has a harder job selling his no privacy for security point. All right. OK, let's start the clock. OK. Hit it. <laughs> okay. Well, obviously, we're here at Web Summit today. And uh, for those of you who were at the opening session last night, we got to hear about some of the ways in which technology is really empowering the world and increasing human potential. The ability to communicate, the ability to cognate, the ability to affect real change around the world. There's real power there, but with real power, there also comes responsibility. And we heard no less a greater mind of our generation than Stephen Hawking tell us that he has real concerns about some of the technologies, such as artificial intelligence. And that phrase rung in my mind that there is, with great power, there comes great responsibility. And I, I Googled it last night to see who was it who first said that, because I knew it must be another great mind of our generation. And it was. It was a great American mind. It was Spider-Man, and obviously this is where we look for some of our guidances to our superheroes. But there's another really great American who has been perhaps the greatest American not to have become president. This person would have changed the world in better ways had they been president, no doubt. And if you're familiar with the life and work of Hillary Rodham Clinton, you'll realize that I am not talking about her, okay? Because her excessive zeal for privacy, her hiding of her emails on private servers, mm. her unwillingness to play ball with the greater collective good, put two words together in the English language which should never have been together, Trump and presidency. So sometimes privacy can hurt us in ways that we didn't anticipate. Now, the American I was actually referring to is Benjamin Franklin. About 250 years ago, he said that those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Now, you may think, well, okay, hold on, that's contrary to the argument here. He's basically saying privacy kills security. But I, I argue otherwise because this is a guy who never watched a single cat video in his life. <laughs> he, he has no understanding of the digital world we live in today. He never sent a tweet. He never had a Facebook account. In fact, the only network he understood and knew was the US Postal Service, because he was the first ever Postmaster General. And if you read more into some of the work that he did, he later said that distrust and caution are the parents of security. Now, that, I think, is more on message that I want to say to you today. The fact that in an open society, we have to be willing to participate to a certain degree. In the slower era that he lived in, there were fewer people living in the United States than have attended the Web Summit over the last seven years. It was a simpler time with simpler measures. He was, in fact, referring in his original quote 
to people who weren't willing to participate when it came to paying their taxes. And just this week, we've had a perfect example with the release of the Paradise Papers, where we found that the rich, the wealthy, the corrupt, the totalitarian dictators have been using offshore methods to store their money away, which harms greater society. Now, when it comes to harming society, I think he was on the money. Now, if you have a $100 bill, he literally is on the money. In, he's recognized for what he said. If you think about the atrocity that happened in Las Vegas last month, Stephen Paddock was able to take 10 satchels full of automatic weapons into his 32nd floor hotel room and kill 58 people because the only concern he had about getting his weaponry into the hotel was making sure he had enough dollar bills to tip the bellboys who carried their weapons up there. Had there been even a simple version of intrusion to his privacy to ask him, sir, why have you got all this heavy stuff going up to your room? They would have had a way of knowing what was going on. The same applies to all of you sitting here. If you've come from overseas, you've gone through metal detectors at airports, you've shown your ID, you've gone through further ID checks getting in here, that's just better for everybody's collected security. I'm not saying we need to have a totalitarian state. I'm not saying I want the NSA in your bedroom. I'm not saying every email. But excessive privacy where people are just not willing to share kills transparency. It kills accountability. Bitcoin and Tor and anonymous web surfing can have positive connotations, but encryption where secrets are hidden away from the rest of the world can also make it possible for terrorists and pedophiles to hide and to undertake the most egregious acts against the rest of humanity. The Brookings Institute probably put it the best when they said that there is a hostile symbiosis between privacy and security. And I put it to you as my argument today, if there is too much privacy, if there is total privacy, if there is unfettered, unchecked, and uncontrolled privacy, then the greater good is not served, and it is not possible for humanity to function in an open society. Thank you very much. All right. All right. All right. Over to you. Ben Franklin. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think the world Ben Franklin was operating in is a little bit different than the world we're operating in today, but he was a pretty big proponent of these ideas of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We, we borrowed those concepts, obviously. We adapted to them into America. But a central concept to that is the idea that within the social contract, we can pursue our own economic destiny. We can protect our own property. And in fact, even in Ben Franklin's time, there were rules about eavesdropping, which really meant literally standing under someone's window and listening to their conversation. So I think that this is a false choice. We do not have to give up our privacy in order to have security, but we do have to have policies where occasionally we give up some elements of it in order to engage in a secure environment. Getting on a plane with hundreds of your closest friends to travel 30,000 feet up in the sky is a situation in which we've all agreed we're gonna give up a little privacy, but we kind of know the landscape there and the trade-off. So I don't think this is an either or choice, and I think in this environment, in this day and age, we have to insist on privacy as part of the conversation in order to get the balance right around security. Because in a digital world, we are living in essentially a golden age of surveillance. It is impossible in modern life to uh, do anything without leaving some form of a digital footprint. For most of us, a search of our digital lives is far more revealing than a search of our own homes or even our own bedrooms. So we have to update some of our legal frameworks to curtail invasions of our privacy, and we should demand this right be appropriately balanced against security concerns when we're updating those frameworks. Because privacy is a form of security, it can create incentives in the marketplace, such as data minimization, that are good for privacy. And it can create incentives for better, stronger encryption, which is also privacy protective. Privacy is also critical for the practice of citizenship. And I bet if we could have Ben Franklin up here on the stage and maybe some of the other founding fathers, they would get that in a democracy, privacy makes it possible to have freedom of expression, choice, association, economic mobility, and thought. And that at its most basic, it serves as a limit to power and a bulwark for liberty. So we're living in an age where I think the idea of controlling our own destinies 
via asserting our own choices is critically important, more important than ever before. And if we relinquish the notion of privacy as a concept, we're essentially surrendering all of that into a broader policy debate. And I think that that would be harmful, ultimately, to individuals. All right. We've got two good well, arguments privacy. advanced here. So uh, the rules say each of you can ask questions of the other, and I can ask questions of both of you. So I'll start with this. You know, in Franklin's time, the threat to privacy was basically the government. You know, so we have a Bill of Rights, but the Constitution doesn't actually specify a right to privacy. The, court, the Supreme Court said it's a number that emanates from other parts of it. These days, it's not just the government that can collect a lot of information about us. These little computers we have in our pockets can collect so much more. So to what extent can we differentiate protecting our privacy from the feds and any other government and individual companies that we cannot vote out of office? We uh, can't really directly hold their CEOs accountable, can we? Well, it's interesting you talk about people's unwillingness to have their data examined by the government and their discomfort at people being able to look at their emails, perhaps, or to examine their identity or their movements. But the same people who often are most egregiously wounded at any thought that the government might know what they're doing will happily give away truckloads of data to Google, to Facebook, to Twitter. Every like, every web search, every movement, every check-in on Forspay, everything you do is being tracked by these big global corporations. So I would say, if you're willing to allow them to have such invasive insight into your daily life, should you not at least give a certain amount of insight to government agencies and to those who would seek to protect you rather than harm you? And that's the social contract you have in a modern society. If you want to live in the backwoods of Kentucky and not deal with anybody else ever in your life, that's fine, go at it. But if you want to board that aircraft and sit next to me, I want to know that your bag was searched. I want to know that your ID was checked. I want to know that I'm not at harm because of something you plan to do. If we can't look into somebody's heart, we can at least look into their luggage, perhaps look into their email, at least know what they're planning to do. I, I just, I don't accept the premise that we, we cannot have both privacy and security. I think we have to be uh, given the choice about how we are sharing and transacting in our information. I think we should be given control over our information, probably more control than we currently have in this environment. And I think that it ought to be clear to us when we are giving away information or when our privacy uh, is being violated in some form. So it's clear when we go through a security checkpoint what is happening. We have a choice at that point about what we are putting in our bags and uh, how it is being reviewed. And, and we can make decisions ahead of time. A lot of my concern about the idea of relinquishing privacy has to do with whether if we give up this notion, we really will be able to retain our own independence and autonomy, especially in a digital economy. So this is an interesting question. We were talking about relinquishing, giving up. There's a trade-off. Can we think of cases where people have made that trade-off and then said later on, wait a second, that's not what I wanted. Give me my privacy back. Can you put the toothpaste back in the tube? Do I yeah. take this one? Well, it, it, sorry, say that again? Think of cases where people have given up their privacy, said, okay, sure, you can know this about me, and then they said later on, no, wait, no. <laughs> well, let's, think, let's undo that. Well, I think Is there ever an undo button in these transactions? We, 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 we have perhaps struck the right balance here where the individual, uh, with their personally identifiable information, can engage with online entities. But the European law has now enshrined the concept of the right to be forgotten. And that, that, I think, strikes the balance that, yes, you can give up your privacy in return for services or in return for certain security, but you have as an intrinsic right as an individual, and coming back in next May, it'll be really strictly enforced with GDPR, the, the new law that enforces on companies the, the need to treat individual data with great care, why it's collected, where it's stored, how it's processed, who has access to it, what purpose they use it for. This will be very strictly controlled so that the the concerns that those who believe that people should give up absolutely no data will now be more carefully controlled and that even law enforcement and government agencies will have to show that they're doing things for a reason with data, for the greater common good. So that, that erosion of privacy is there for a good reason, for your safety. 
So I'm a consumer protection enforcer, and I, in that role, spend a lot of time looking at data breaches and the consequence of them. Mm -hmm. I can think of lots of consumers in America, especially, who have given up data and now regret it. Think, for example, of the high-profile data breach of Ashley Madison. For those of you that are, aren't familiar or don't recall, it was a website that was a platform for uh, married people to meet other married people to have affairs with. This is incredibly sensitive, secretive, private information. And when it was made public, it had a tremendous consequence on the people whose information was breached. Now, I, I get that the, there was sharing involved there and uh, hacking and breach. But uh, the point is, in this environment, anybody that's promising you 100% security is probably selling something. And if you don't insist on privacy and don't think about the consequences of this information sharing, then you're in jeopardy of giving up information that no one can assure you will be held protected perfectly. So the idea that we're going to give up all of these, the autonomy and the choice and the control and somehow result in a more secure environment to me is just a false uh, proposition to begin with. So I'm glad you mentioned the GDPR for the, the non-EU types. That's the General Data Protection Regulation, a very, very long piece of rulemaking. I've actually skimmed every page of it to write about it. It was kind of difficult to sell an editor on that particular story. And it does lay out some really sweeping consumer protection clauses saying you have to be able to take your data back from somebody. And I'm assuming this isn't going to happen in the U.S. anytime soon, is it? Is this a debate or question? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, well, so, so it's different. You're right. In the U.S., we don't really have uh, the same set of rights. Um, we do not right now have a generalized right to take our data back to control our data. I'm a consumer protection advocate in the U.S., so I actually believe that kind of control over our data would be helpful. But I'll tell you this, if we jettison the idea of privacy from this policy conversation, we are not going to get to the situation in the U.S. where we even have more control over our data. What we need, from my perspective, is more control, more choices, and more transparency. How optimistic are we about technology to provide self-help to people, like in the U.S., where we're all rugged individualists? Things like uh, you know, tracking blockers and web browsers, is that part of the answer then? I mean, I think there are different technological solutions. The ones that I like the best are all about competing on privacy, bringing innovations into the marketplace, blockchain, encryption, stronger encryption, right? These are great privacy protective technologies. And they exist, I think, in part because we all believe that in this environment, we need to be able to exert control and protect our own spheres. So question for you, you mentioned encryption, you mentioned encryption, should, should the feds have some kind of backup key for my phone or the iPhones in this room? Well, one man's shield can be another man's dagger and that's the problem with the world of technology and encryption, secure communication. If you look at any of the terrorist cells that have been broken recently, almost without exception they've been using secure means of easily available communication. So I'm not saying that it's necessarily entirely a bad thing that there's secure communication. If I was a, a, a dissident living in a hostile totalitarian state, my life would probably depend on it. But society as a whole has to ask the wider question, is it a good thing that people with really bad intentions are able to use the same technology? Should there not be some way that the good guys, the people who are out to protect our essential liberties and our security and our freedom, have to actually make sure that those technologies are not being used for, ma for malintent, that a certain amount of our privacy should be given up for the greater collective security and common good. That, unfortunately, is part of the social contract of living in a digital era. All right, so I agree. Part of the social contract is giving up a certain amount of privacy, but the critical question here is how much do we give up? And so if we jettison the whole concept of privacy to begin with, then we're not even having an incremental conversation. And I think when it comes to privacy protective technologies like encryption, that it's incumbent on the government not to discourage and undermine the security and privacy of those technologies by, for example, mandating back doors. I think this is a really bad solution to the national security and law enforcement challenge of making sure that we are, we are giving law enforcement the tools that they need to go after the bad guys. But they have so many tools in this environment. 
This is the golden age of surveillance. There are tons of tools that can be brought to bear. And we need to be having a conversation about how government and law enforcement and national security apparatus can adapt to this environment, whether that's hacking their way around the problem or improving their own technical capabilities or coming up with better frameworks to exchange information. And now it's time for closing statements. Well, I'll go back to the comment I made during my presentation saying that there is at its essence, at its core, a hostile symbiosis between privacy and security. And if we put privacy down at 100%, cannot be touched, then we are fundamentally harming security. In the modern world, you have to be willing to participate with those around you and to give up a certain amount of your privacy in a controlled manner. Otherwise, you cannot guarantee security of the entire society. So when the vote comes, I ask you to raise your hand and vote with safety, security, and the sanctity of life. Thank you very much. <laughs> and right. you get the last word, then, then we will go to the show of hands. All right, last word. I say hold fast to your privacy because we can get the balance right here, but we have to strive for it, and it requires balancing privacy against security. That's more important than ever in this environment. Privacy itself is a form of security. Privacy is critical to citizenship and democracy and expression and choice. And because you evoke Stephen Hawking, I'm going to say in this environment, Privacy is a critical limit of power, which is going to matter more as the technology gets more intelligent and more predictive. It may become the one way we can preserve human autonomy. All right, it's time to see a show of hands. Can we get the house lights up? Okay, uh, humans. Let me on digitize my side. your faces. <laughs> yeah. Who is in willing to give up a little privacy for security now after having heard all these folks out? Yeah. Okay, and who is not going for that bargain at all? Okay, I think you have won this side of it here. Thank you, thank you. So we'll have to come back and debate on how to pronounce privacy correctly. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much.